have one more. Um, I have one more item I'd like to talk about. This is the CARES report, and I found my missing memo. It was right where it belonged, and I just didn't see it. So the issue is, is that um, the Department of Public Health has asked that we use some enforcement discretion for a period of time um, with respect to reporting to the immunization registry, Im immunization registries to allow them time to set up their remaining immunization registries. So here's what we've got. The, CDPH has 10 regional registries um, where they collect information on immunizations administered. Right now, they are, um, they have, it's called CARES 2, which is the more automated version of the two, and they are running in four regions right now, Northern California, Greater Sacramento, Central Coast, and in Inland Empire. Um, CARES 2 is also going to be rolled out December 5th, which is about a little over a month now, and that's going to occur in the Bay Area and Central Valley. And then the final rollout is expected by March 6th for pharmacies in Los Angeles and Orange County. So um, basically the delay is only involving those entities that report data manually. The pharmacies that are submitting electronically can do cures or CARES too right now, so it doesn't really affect them. We know that most of the chains are already doing this electronically, but I suggest to the board that we use some enforcement discretion for about another six months to allow everyone to come into compliance so that they can report to cures <coughs> without having to do it under the old CARES 1 system and then convert in four to six months to the new CARES system. But again, that's only for manual um, entries and um, we just really want to support the use of the um, immunization registry, which is a requirement of our regs. So um, I would just like to use enforcement discretion for six months. And I don't know whether the board needs to say anything other than this is what we're going to do. When we go into a pharmacy and we look and we'll ask how they're reporting information <coughs> into the CARES registry and we'll use that um, to advise them, well, you can go and submit electronically right now, or if you're doing it manually, by March 5th, you should be able to do it electronically everywhere in the state. I, I think that's a good idea. I've, I've heard uh, several comments about the inefficiencies, and so I think that's... But we don't want to burn the support for the care system by having them do manual yes. and then convert over to a whole new system. Um, so, anyway, okay. Laura, that's do you have any concerns or comments? Um, it's not ideal um, to have a law that you're not enforcing, but it's perfectly reasonable, I think, under these circumstances where what's being described is that there's some legal that impossibility, technology. Yeah, exactly. some technological sure technical issues. issues. And it's been going it. on this and way so, for a while before the law right. happened anyway. And the executive officer has the enforcement discretion she's talking about. I think what she's doing um, by informing the board is really bringing you into the fold so that you're aware that, and that the public is aware that we recognize that there's a, a disconnect between our law and um, how it's working. But it's of a temporary right, nature. Of a temporary we will nature. know where we've gone and if we have concerns about whether or not someone's going to be ready to submit electronically, we'll be able to go back and check and see if they have come March 6th. Right. So. So, so it's not my perfect world, but I, I accept it and think it's a reasonable approach. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. It was a good idea. Actually, it is as an interim. Anything else that you have? No, it or took me to March 6th to find the memo then. Public comment on this last item. Okay. All right. We're, we have one more 50-year pharmacist that came a little late, so we're going to go ahead and honor her. Not old enough. <laughs> I know. She looks young. <laughs> Sarah Golt Conrad. Yes. Did I pronounce it right? Yes. Okay. Yes. She has served in the San Francisco Bay Area and you've worked in retail, community pharmacist, and then at San Francisco General Hospital. Yes. It is now known as Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center as an inpatient staff pharmacist for 37 years. Yes. And you're still working there. I am still working there and enjoying it every very, day. Very wow. good. Where did you go to school? I went to school at Howard University in Washington, D.C. I'm originally from Macon, Georgia, where all the music came out. Oh, and the great. music, the music uh, 
um, museum is actually there, Otis Redding and James Brown and Little Richard. Uh, I remember even Little Richard playing when I was in elementary school. <laughs> That's the best music. Yeah, so right. then I went to Howard, and then I graduated, got married, and moved to California, and that has become my home. That's great. Yes. And what made you, so you've worked most of your career in inpatient? Yes. In so inpatient. what makes you stay in hospital pharmacy? Uh, I love both the staff, but I love working with um, knowing what the patients are getting, and I believe that um, standards are, are best done when you have your heart dedicated, knowing that people are in the bed and you're making a difference. Yes. Well, thank you for making a difference and for your commitment to the patients of our state. Yes. And congratulations for your 50 years. Okay, moving on to item seven. Discussion and consideration of proposed regulations to amend and add Title 16 CCR Section 1702, 1702.1, 1702.2, and 1702.5 related to renewal requirements. Um, at the July, this July 2013, that was right, it was three years ago? The board meeting, the board approved <laughs> proposed text. I just want to make sure that wasn't a typo. This was not a priority. No, regrettably, it's not. The proposed text to amend and or add these sections related to standardized reporting of convictions <coughs> and discipline at the time of renewal for pharmacists, pharmacy techs, and designated representatives, as well as any required <coughs> non-resident wholesalers and non-resident pharmacies, and this is to report disciplinary actions by other entities at time of renewal. The 45-day comment period on this regulation began on August 12th of this year and ended September 26th, and the board received a few comments and the comments are attached. And most of them, I think, are the comments that we received in regard to the $500 limit right. that is a requirement, and, and, and uh, we can talk about that. So at this meeting today, the board will have the opportunity to discuss the future of the regulation and determine what course of action we wish to pursue. The two options are adopt the regulation as noticed, um, and notice for public comment, as notice for public comment, or amend the regulation and open it up for another 15-day period. So board members, I mean, I, I, when I was looking at this, I'm thinking $500 is like a traffic ticket these days. Yeah, it is. It is. So it really ticket. isn't that. Somebody, somebody mentions going through one of those cameras. Yeah. And, and it's pretty close to $500. So there was, and I <laughs> want to ask you. Did you see Jane, Dr. Stein, I thought, yeah. might have had a good I, I agree. I was just, just going to say, I think what, um, what Dr. Stein has said is that it referred to a fine, not a ticket. I mean, basically a yeah, fine. A traffic fine, he as defined in the motor vehicle section 42,000.1 rather than the arbitrary amount that a violator will pay depending on the local jurisdiction piling on fees and penalty assessments. So I think he was talking about a specific fine rather than. But so I guess we just have to make sure uh, that it is, it's clear like in all states. So I think that that was kind of our staff's uh, feedback. You have to just word it so it's, you know, it's, it's, we're not just talking about California. Josh looks like he wants to make a comment. Well, I... I, I sound a look. <laughs> he, she, Jenny non-verbally communicated with me. Um, I actually agree with uh, Mr. Vrabel uh, that there's no reason to have any dollar figure reference in there. I think you can just do traffic. In fact, I mean, so to remind the board, an infraction for our purposes does not count as a conviction. So the only way in which we would be concerned about something that is registered as an infraction is if the conduct that it involved would in, uh, would in some way be basis for discipline or denial. So the conduct that the board is typically concerned with is uh, operating motor vehicle under the influence of something. So that so I think you can just as effectively get to that conduct by saying traffic infractions not involving drugs or alcohol and the dollar figure doesn't help or hinder uh, your e effort to get to that conduct. So we just, you're saying take out the $500. Yeah, I'm just saying traffic under. infractions not involving. Just yeah, well, and, just, and I, the language is under 500, so we'd want to take out yeah. under. Also. Under, yeah. So, so we move those two words. Going out 
for another 45. You don't have to go back out for 15 days. Yeah, 15 days, but not 45. On uh, 17021 and 17022, there's some um, a date that should probably be changed. There's some what? Yeah. There's yeah. a date Thank that you should be July, changed. Thank you, July 2014. We think, we think we need to fix that. Yeah. To make I think it, it 2017 was, instead of 2014. Well, it was fixed on the first one. On 1702, they crossed it out, but I don't think it did. No, it yeah, it's not on, one, on 1701 and two, Eight. Point one and point yeah. 2 needs to be changed. If I may clarify, the reason that it's crossed out on that first section is that requirement already existed. So when we implemented for the pharmacist specifically, that was the renewal. So that's why that's being removed from the regulation. But for the others, we need to specify the date that that requirement is going to go into effect, which is why I think Mr. Lippy is suggesting that we put that in um, as a date in the future as opposed to in the past. Correct. Are you recommending July 2017? Yes. Is that reasonable, Jenny? Yes. Okay. Well, I, it's up to the board to determine reasonableness. I'd okay. let you know if it was so I'm, he, so I'm hearing two. Okay. How about is that feasible, Jenny? Yes. I'm Albert. Entirely doable. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to make a comment on, um, I know we do a lot of disciplinary uh, action on those uh, people have a DUI. And I'd like to have it on this, uh, have it on a subject on one of the future meeting, so we could discuss about this. Uh, because I don't think a simple DUI we should be, you know, discipline them because it's very easily, you know, one or two uh, glass of wine. I think you reach that limit. So I don't think the fact that as long as they're not doing on the job, I don't think we should uh, penalize so heavily. So I'd like to have that on the subject in the future topic. Thank you, Albert. So I'm hearing two changes that we have talked about to the regs. Right. One of them is to remove the words under 500, under 1702B, and every section where it says it references that $500 in the tech so and the designated representative. So we're going to take the money out altogether? Uh, yeah, that, that's, the, that's what I've heard. And then the other one is to change on 1702.1 and 1702.2 the date of July 2014 to 2017. Correct. July 1st, 2017. So does anyone want to make President, a motion to that fact? I'll make Madam a motion President. unless you want to stand. Oh, wait. No, okay. I was Laura. Really waiting for you. I'd like to oh. second it. Okay. So I would just, um, I, I don't know a lot of detail about it. I do know that department-wide, most of the um, agencies do have a threshold in it. And I'm not advocating one way or the other, but you may want to check if, if anybody from an, your enforcement staff is here to see what you might be losing, if anything. So, Laura, is this one of the regs that will have to have a department review? No? No, no it won't have pre-review. It's going to go okay. through the way it is. So, okay. you're, we so don't it's only have to newly worry about issued right regs. Issue. My comment, I think, is just more about factually if you if somebody from the board staff has information about what you might be losing. Um, you're talking about reporting, not necessarily, e even if it's reported, does not mean it's going to result in any disciplinary action, either by way of, any enforcement action by way of citation or discipline. Um, but I think you want to know what you might be cutting out. And it may be perfectly appropriate, but if you have staff in the, uh, available that could address it, that might be worth, that might be a question worth hearing about. Can we, can we find out, Jenny, whether that's going to, is there a dollar, do you know if there's a dollar value that the department requires? Josh, can I ask no, you? No, it's, it's board by board that would be set. I can, I can make a couple of inquiries to see whether or not other boards have a set amount. Um, and if they do, what is it? I, I'm not. I'm not aware. You think that there is a, a set when, amount? When this language was first promulgated by the department, the department had a figure in it, and I'm pretty sure it was the three hundred. It was three hundred. I was going to say it used to be three hundred. And I believe both BRN and BVMPT have gone up to a thousand. Um, uh, but I think they're using the after. I know PA board was considering changing the threshold, um, and I. The only reason I suggest maybe just talking to the to somebody on your staff who has feedback about what you might not be collecting. And I, the problem is I don't know. I don't see enough of, I don't see that level. And it may be that it's, that, that deleting it all together is a, what is it, what, well, we, what's, what's, what's the requirement? Is there a requirement a that we call? have to have this dollar limit? Because we're dealing with so much right. 
at the board level to have to get all these traffic tickets, even if we got them, to have to sift through them. Well, and also flexibility. I mean, you know, things just go up in price, and so then we don't yeah. have to come back and, and yeah. we fix it. You know, Josh, I had a question for you. Like, would reckless driving, because I'm, I'm trying to think of um, a possible infraction, like reckless driving, that could possibly be of interest to us that might be like a $500 fine. You know, well, I mean, but it still has to involve alcohol or drugs, right? So, well, no, I mean, there's various kinds of reckless driving. There's a wet reckless, which involves alcohol, but then there's just straightforward reckless right. driving. And most of those are what are called wobbler offenses that could be charged either as an infraction or as a misdemeanor. That's why if you look on a traffic ticket that that CHP or whatever hands out, it always has a little M or I next to it, so they can circle how they're how they're intending it to be charged. So. Um, <clears throat> But if it, but if it's ultimately charged and can, you know entered as a and as, as an infraction, it's not a conviction for our purposes. So we we would not be able to take action based on the conviction itself. We could look to the underlying conduct. I you know I think opinions can vary as to whether straightforward reckless driving right. without an alcohol or drug component would be something that this board would be concerned with. Maybe you would be. May, maybe other board members wouldn't be. Um, so I think. But I think a reckless driving, uh, you would lose the ability, I guess, to get that re reckless driving if it were an infraction, if it doesn't get, involve alcohol. I was alcohol. just grabbing at, like, that was the thing that came to mind. What, what other kind of infractions could possibly be around, you know, that we wouldn't be getting by saying if it involves alcohol uh, Things or like, drugs? like uh, driving with a suspended license or driving without a license would be another thing that sometimes gets adjudicated as an infraction and not as a misdemeanor. Um, typically, if that's the only thing that they're going to pin on somebody, then they'll pin it as an infraction. But if it's combined with other things, then they'll charge it as a misdemeanor. Anne? Uh, if I can just say that sometimes, um, and I don't, wanna, I don't want you to think that I'm talking specific to the traffic ones, but there are times when we receive a notice and it's, for example, driving with a suspended license and then when we find out why it was a, a suspended license we find out that there was a previous issue that we did not know about that could be um, you know driving under the influence those kinds of things so there are times when we, we rely on the information from the Department of Justice and we don't always get that because maybe they don't receive it or whatever else so there are times where um, as we're doing application investigations as well as other cases through the CCU that we find out about different about um, earlier items that we were not aware of. So tra driving without a license, is that going to be under 500 typically? I don't know. I'm sorry. Probably. We don't know. I, it Again, really depends on the jurisdiction. And it depends. I mean, the fine, the fine will typically no. be under 500, but the total cost will probably be more than 500. Well, you know, Can you're I, driving without your seatbelt on. Right. Yeah. You know, if you're filling the stop for a school bus going around the corner, that's an infraction. Yeah, it just seems like the dollar value is arbitrary. I, so, I mean, the, another possible approach, and I'm just, I'm just throwing this out there, is that you could strike this language entirely. You could just say report convictions, and take out the, don't report these to us, and just let them report whatever they're going to report, and that way they, you know, technically an infraction is not a conviction under 480. So if they are clever enough to know that they won't report the infraction Why don't we just most say people are just going to report infraction. yeah or report yeah. convictions not infractions <laughs> yeah right but the but we then again clear. don't you want infractions that involve alcohol and drug, yeah, drug yeah, abuse we do. so yeah. oh. we absolutely do on those yeah no i i think this i'm sorry did you want to well, okay, I've been holding my breath. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I, I think we want to leave in traffic infractions not involving alcohol, dangerous drugs, or controlled substances do not need to be disclosed. I mean, I, yeah. I, I like yeah, that. I, I agree with that. I'm, I'm just with not that. feeling the love to uh, the $500. Yeah, I agree. It, Stan. I was, uh, I was wondering where Laura was coming from. You seem to, uh, uh, you know, have a thought about why we should leave a dollar amount in, and I was wondering what your thought was about that. Um, it, it, it may be left over from having been around this for a long time, um, and, I, and I see you are not alone in raising this threshold because it's, it, there's a balance there between getting the information and um, being overwhelmed by the information that you get where you can't do anything with it. Um, 
this is kind of why I was hoping maybe if, if staff had some input, I, I liked what your assistant EO said, which is that, that, that there might be things that you're getting knowledge of them. This is about reporting. This isn't necessarily about taking action against these. So um, in other words, this, this requirement is a renewal requirement on the license. So the individual is just indicating that it happened. It doesn't mean that the board itself is going to take any action just because it's reported. Yeah, um, but we're, right now, if we keep the dollar value, we're only going to get the suspended license if it's going to be over $500, over 500, according to this. So we're still, in some jurisdictions we may get them, some we may not. Right. So it's an arbitrary type of. It, it, it is. And um, my, so I come from, I'm very, very conservative and you don't know what you don't know. So I just, without knowing um, what you're going to be losing and the type of information, maybe samples of what you're going to be losing, I'm, I'm hesitant to recommend it. Bless you. So should we just defer this? Uh, Jenny did send an email out to our enforcement staff, and we can take that on later on yeah. and move on to the next item let's so that we that. have all the information yeah. that we need. Okay, so let's move on to the next item, which is uh, item 8, discussion and consideration of proposed regulations to add Title 16 CCR, Section 1776, related to prescription drug take back. Now, this board has had a long history with this regulation. January 2006, we opened it up for public comment. April 2016, there were two hearings um, in public hearings on this topic, on this regulation. At the April board meeting, we again modified it and made 15-day comment. June 2016, there were some policy decisions that were made and we instructed staff to modify the language. July 2016, we opened again for a 15-day comment. And September 2016, we opened it up for an additional 15-day comment. So now we've got this um, last, the third 15-day comment period ended on October 14th. So now we have the regulation back in front of us. So draft one contains the modified text as approved by the board at the last board meeting in September. And that's labeled September 22nd, 2016. Draft two is a clean version to enable us to review it um, in a much cleaner format and it does not contain all the strikeouts. So today, um, we can review the 15, the third 15-day comment period um, input that we received, and the staff recommendation is to adopt the regulatory language and delegate to the executive officer um, that normal language that we have about the authority to make technical or non-substantive changes. I would make a motion we do exactly that. Second. Second. Okay. Everyone's reviewed the public comments. I think most of them were in agreement are just going to be rejected per the staff recommendations. Right. Well, and it seems like most of the public comments are Repeat. reiterations of things we've gone through before and yeah. thoroughly. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Okay. Any board members before board comments before we open it up to public comment? Okay. Public comment on the prescription drug take back regulations. If you want to come up, please. If you can speak into the microphone so we can all hear you. Good morning. Good morning. Be before I begin on this topic, I just want to say that I want to congratulate the pharmacists you've honored today. I am someone who takes a tremendous amount of medication on a daily basis. My local pharmacist has helped me um, tremendously in managing that medication, managing my insurance, managing my doctors. And so um, I want to um, thank them for their service. Um, my name is Andrea Ventura. I'm here on behalf of Clean Water Action. Clean Water Action represents 50,000 Californians who are our members and have o who have overwhelmingly supported um, drug take back um, with the um, pharmaceutical manufacturing community taking responsibility for implementing those programs, extended producer responsibility. And while I appreciate, I have sent in written comments numerous times on behalf of our members. Uh, we have seen changes as a result of that in the proposed regulation. Um, we remain somewhat frustrated by what's before us today. Um, and there, these may not seem like major concerns to you, but they are to, to us and our members. So let me be clear, first of all, that we absolutely prioritize the need to be safe 
to be secure in these programs. Okay, N that's why for many years, while we were concerned about the effects of unused pharmaceuticals in our homes, and I have boxes of them in my home, um, you know, getting into the hands of those who would abuse them or getting into our waterways where scientists are telling us what we don't know is what the long-term effects of that are with these trace amounts of cocktails in our drinking water. While we, are, we have been concerned about that for a very long time and want to see this step of taking back these products in a way that ensures they don't get into the wrong hands or into the environment, we waited for a long time working with public agencies, including the DEA, to move forward to ensure that these programs are secure and safe. So let me stress that. But we are frustrated by the repeated comment that um, our comments that the DEA has addressed this issue thoroughly and that some of the specifications that you're putting into these regulations are actually creating additional barriers. We're, we're frustrated that that comment gets rejected over and over again, and we're not the only ones making it, that um, the board's, because the board's regulation mirrors the DEA's regulations with a few minor differences, and that these differences don't conflict with the DEA or um, mean that um, that the board's regulations would not be compliant with the DEA. That statement shows that the staffer who is making that recommendation has not heard <coughs> what the public interest community, what local jurisdictions who have passed ordinances, what other regulators have consistently since January been telling you. That it's not a matter that the regulations wouldn't comply with the DEA, it's that they're getting in the way of programs that have been passed by elected officials that ensure that we can move forward with these take back programs. Now some of these things you've addressed, the physical barrier or walls around the kiosks, we appreciate you hearing us on that, it was not viable, um, and a few other aspects of that. What I'm here to say today is that we still feel that these regulations, the process being slow, we do want you to move forward, the process being slow has, whether intentionally or not intentionally, helped delay implementation of local ordinances that gets these drugs off the street and out of our environment, okay? Moving forward is a good thing, but we continue to oppose, and most of the comments you have received over and over again, we're repeating ourselves not because we just want to hear ourselves talk, but because these are important points, of telling us that a pharmacist can use their professional judgment to conclude that they can't comply with DEA regulations is a problem. And the reason is this. First of all, every or, most of the ordinances do not require pharmacies to host kiosks, okay? The two that do have an out. If a pharmacist says, I can't, they, they tell the pharmacist, you have to compl comply with the DEA regulations. If the pharmacist does not feel that they can do that, they can go to those jurisdictions and explain why. By making a blackened statement like this, it puts no responsibility on that pharmacist to not comply with the local ordinance. It just allows them to say, you know, I don't really want to do this. Okay? Now, we have never advocated that these programs should be required by pharmacies. We want to encourage pharmacies because that's where our members want to bring back their drugs. But the, but the point is that what my members are perceiving is that what you're actually saying, maybe not intentionally, but what you're actually saying is, we'll allow you to do these programs, but wink, wink, you don't have to. It's a discouragement and it's causing confusion by pharmacists that are wanting to do these programs but are unsure what it is you're actually asking them to do. They understand the DEA regulations. They don't want to the go barriers on, or confusion. Before you go on, uh, there's yeah. no wink wink. Yeah, I, I, That's I insulting said, to the board. What I'm telling yes. you, sir, what I am telling you. I'm not, not, I'm telling you. What, what I'm telling what you, sir, is, is that that is the perception that I've is said. That is an incorrect perception, and not, for you to bring it up here is, is unnecessary. I also said that if, that may not be intentional, but what is happening is that Big Pharma is coming to the table 
and telling local jurisdictions we can't move forward because we don't know what the board is saying. We are hearing pharmacists say we are confused. What is the difference between what the Board of Pharmacy is doing and what the DEA is requiring us? And what is happening is that is helping the pharmaceutical industry, the manufacturers, not the pharmacists, who are trying to oppose these. Okay, so what, so what I am saying is that what we have consistently said to this board is tell your pharmacists we need to comply with DEA regulations, keep these programs safe, and that if you comply with the DEA regulations, you can move forward. Do not add extra barriers. This is one of the few cases where the state of California does not have to add to the cumbersomeness. It's a narrow view of how we are protecting the public and we want these programs to move forward. Thank Did you, you have a uh, well, question? Th this board governs the practice of pharmacy in our state. And I agree with Dr. Shad, there is no wink wink on any of our regulations. They're very clear. And none of our regulations are have any wiggle room in them. This is the way it is. That's so right. we are all on the same page. We want to move this forward. I've heard two board members already motion and second. This is a way for the pharmacies in our state to know how to interpret some of the DA regulations so it's safe practice for our consumers and our patients. What we're hearing from pharmacists who have participated in stakeholder programs um, as these ordinances are being passed is they're confused by this. They understand the DEA rules. They understand what the bins have to do. They understand the, the requirements for safety. They, require, they understand the kinds of drugs. By the way, we are concerned with both over-the-counter and, and prescription drugs. I understand that your focus is prescription. Um, they understand uh, many of the rules, but some of these rules are, they are completely confused with what this board is coming out with, and they, are, they feel that they've got it, they understand it, and what they really would like to see is, and certainly our members would like to see is, comply with federal law, we're covered, we're safe, and we want this to move forward now. There's a lot of instances where there is federal law and there also is state law. I mean, the yes, DA, for I know. example, I work on that very has often. a number of regulations on controlled substances. Mm -hmm. We have also state regulations. So there's a lot of areas where this occurs. Um, maybe what we can do, and I don't know, I'll turn to Jenny, is could we develop some guidance if there's certain specific areas, an FAQ document or something, kind of like what we've done with sterile compounding, if there are questions that come up from Absolutely, and, and in fact, this is a major reg for us and for the public, and so we probably do need to provide some additional guidance insofar as it will help implement, but the DEA regs actually say voluntary themselves. Yeah, yeah we've never said it, broader, it shouldn't be. We've we never said that. Which is, we understand that, but, it, but in some cases, a cornerstone of our practice is the pharmacist, anyone can own a pharmacy, only a pharmacist can be responsible for the operations of the pharmacy, and we hold that individual very responsible for things. A lot of our disciplinary actions involve the pharmacist in charge who is held accountable for mm -hmm. things to the point that it's frustrating, I think, to the profession sometimes that this is occurring. But for us, for us to basically allow a pharmacy to just do whatever without holding that PIC responsible is, is a problem for public safety. And thus, we really want that PIC to be responsible for either being all in if you're doing a collection receptacle. The mail order is, or the mail back is one thing, but the collection receptacle presents problems for a lot of reasons. And if you've got too small a pharmacy, if you're in a very dangerous area, if you've got some other reason, we think that the PIC should be empowered to do it, and that com is commensurate with a voluntary program to a degree. But the law and requires that. The requir and allows for that even in the two ordinances. And again, we didn't, we didn't advocate that, that pharmacies were required in Santa Cruz, for instance, to participate. But even in that case where they did make that mandatory, there is an out. If a pharmacist comes in and says, look, where, where would you want me to do this where I can comply with the law and then the county, then they get a pass. Well, then that's, that's consistent with what our reg says because that PIC needs to go to the county, make the local officials aware of his or her objections to running a collection bin and why it's unsafe for public to have one of these collection bins in that pharmacy and that's appeasing both us and the local jurisdiction. I would still say that this serves, perhaps unintentionally, but it serves to discourage pharmacists from participating. Well, I hope not. Because I, 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 I hope not too. To do but but that's what we're hearing. Can I, can I suggest that during this public comment period, it may not be 
worthwhile to have extended back and forth with each comment. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Do you have any other comments? The only other comment I want to make is that we have a continued concern about the issue of the preloaded self-injection um, uh, types of medications like the EpiPens. These are a major source of a problem because unlike other medications, there is, a, there is an expectation and even a hope that they are never used and they become you know, unusable after a while. Um, while we understand this consideration of safety, you know, I deal with water professionals that are getting stuck online with Sharp. So we need to make sure that those things that can still contain medication that is still getting into the environment should be allowed to be collected if they're in their original um, packaging where it's puncture proof, okay? Um, and because that, we do believe that is allowable under the health and safety code. We have seen a lot of uh, the ordinances that, you know, are asking for that to be collected, um, and we continue to hope that the board would reconsider uh, exempting them from these programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment on this regulation? Hello, good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Afternoon. Um, my name is Aileen Leung. I work with the city and county of San Francisco. I just want to thank you all for all of your hard work on this issue. I know it's been a long journey um, and you've all been a, um, really great and considering all the comments. Um, and I know it's a lot con to consider. There's one comment that I wanted to make and it's regarding the Sharps exclusion to the regulations. Um, we are requesting that you add an exemption to this exclusion to allow unused, still in its original packaging, preloaded self-injector devices um, and have that be allowed to be put into the receptacle. We don't believe there is a public safety issue. We don't believe it um, would be harmful to the pharmacist. These products are designed to be carried around in your purse, in your backpack, in your pocket um, for quick use. And if it's still in its original packaging, there should be no um, problem with that. Um, to my knowledge, there's no other regulation that prohibits the commingling of these items into a receptacle me uh, meant for pharmaceuticals. And um, I noticed in your response to the comments, um, your staff mentions the section on business and professions code. Um, and I took a quick look at it, and by no means I'm not a lawyer, obviously. And um, this, this, this section is titled hypodermic needles and syringes. And to me, and, and the whole section talks about um, who's able to sell needles and syringes to the public and how exchange programs are run. And I don't believe that auto injectors would necessarily fall under this, this line item under this section. Um, so I, I'm asking that you take a, another look at that. And the last thing I'm going to say is there are overall larger implications of adding this, of not putting an exclusion to this. Um, there's implications are ha on how programs are designed and run. Um, if there is no exemption for unused auto injectors that are still in its original packaging, um, that means that these, ne these products need to be collected separately from a collection receptacle, even though it's still going for incineration. And I know um, there was an email from Allison Dabney from the Department of Public Health that was brought up that said that these products should ultimately go for incineration and not for autoclaving, which is generally what is happening with sharps and syringes with no pharmaceuticals in them. Um, and there's also implications on, on how city and county um, folks what they tell the public. You know, I get calls from the public all the time asking, how do I dispose of these EpiPens, these auto injectors that I have never used before? It's, you know, it's not going to poke anybody. And I, and if there is no exemption in this, in these regulations, that means I would have to tell people to go grab a sharps container because it wouldn't be allowed to be put into the receptacle. Um, so thank you all. That's just my two cents. Thank you. Laura, do you have any uh, on this issue about the sharps and the epi pens and such? Can you give us some insight? So the epi pen isn't described, and I don't know what the if there's a technical term for that type of device. But what the board does have a law that says, and this is section forty one forty six of the BMP, 
uh, Business and Professions Code. A pharmacy may accept the return of needles and syringes from the public if contained in a Sharps container as defined in Section uh, 117,750 of the Health and Safety Code. So that description, if as I'm assuming that the EpiPens contain, that they are Sharps, um, but they specifically <laughs> require that you use a Sharps container and that health and safety code provision that's referenced there and the descriptions that I found of what a Sharps container is, is one that has very definitive, um, it's, it, it's a rigid, contain, rigid and um, puncture resistant, I think, container um, that does not, is different than what is required in for the, the liners. liners of the take back regulations. So this would, in your opinion, this would mean the liners would not necessarily be a viable solution if EpiPens were disposed in them? Um, you would have to basically make the liner a, a, a Sharps container. But I, I guess the real the question is, and if I, I might have heard you incorrectly, that if an EpiPen has been used, you have to return it in the Sharps container. What well, if that EpiPen has just expired to sell the package? So I think that therein is an, a question that I haven't dealt with, and I don't know um, perhaps the um, pharmacist on the board. I've never seen one, so, so I don't know. But if think it's, like a, sharp, a, needle it's a sharp, yeah. it is the, I mean, I think we've heard discussion from the public in the past that um, while some versions might have the needle retracted or, yeah. is that an it's, the, the pointy yeah. part, um, the, the puncturing like part is retracted. Some, Some are not. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I think Ryan's asking a question that is not really a legal question. It's more of a policy question. Like, as lawyers, all we can do is interpret what the statute says. And the statute says needles and syringes. So since an EpiPen includes a needle and a syringe, we would assume that it, it, it can only be, you know, returned by way of a sharps container. But there's obviously a policy underlying that, which is, you might assume that that is meant to refer to used sharps and syringes because those are the ones that would you know represent a biohazard and ones that are in the original packaging necessarily wouldn't but that's not the law doesn't make that distinction clear so as lawyers we can only give you we can only advise you that as the law is written it's more inclusive and seems to include all needles and syringes and saying that the only way they can be returned to a pharmacy is by way of a sharps container. So that's all we can tell you. Because if it's in the original packaging, I mean, you'd have to, if, in order for this to apply, if the original packaging would be like a sharps container and provide, you know, impenetrable. Well, I mean, it would, I, I, so the original cardboard. package wouldn't be like a sharps container, but I don't yeah. even think that's the issue. You know, the purpose of the policy is to protect, mm -hmm. you know, the public from exposure. Mm -hmm. And if something's in its original container, do you have exposure, right? If that yeah. pen sticks you, no one else has used it. Right. And so even if that is in a plastic Ziploc bag and it sticks you, if no one has used it, the public is still safe from any you know, biologicals that could you know, get into their system. I, think, I guess the question is how does one determine, how does one determine if it's well, never been used? I mean, well, an EpiPen sorry, so is very yes. difficult to tell if it's so, been used. Well, no, it's, it, it, it's not very difficult to tell. If it's in its original container mm -hmm. unopened, I, I think I, I would, I would treat everything part. as a potential Why? type of contamination because you don't know where it's been. Well, you it's, really don't it's, know. If it's in its original container and unopened. It's hard to, t I mean, I've used EpiPens and it's not easy to tell whether they've been opened but, or not. But I think the question yes, is, so you're, you guys are talking about the sharps part, which I think you were referencing. The prior speaker was talking about the drug part and the EpiPen. Mm -hmm. So even if it hasn't been used, the, there's actually drug in there, and so now we're talking about the drug possibly getting into the water. No, we're talking about disposal. How do you dispose of it? But aren't the sharps yeah, incinerated exactly. too, though, Debbie? Sharp. I mean, is there a reason why you couldn't put that in the sharps container? No sharps are, right now, they're largely um, autoclaved, which means they're, they go under steam sterilization for you know 30 minutes or so, 250 mm -hmm. degrees, and it's not the same treatment that um, incineration goes for. And so we are really concerned about the active ingredients that are still in these products, um, mm -hmm. and they need to be properly handled. So they're autoclaved and they get put into landfill? Exactly. Um, and so to, I don't mean this for this to go this back and forth thing, um, 
I did take a quick look at the FDA website, and they actually make a distinction between needles, syringes, lancets, auto-injectors. And while there is a larger overall term that they use to include all of these items, which are sharps, the Business and Professions Code specifically calls out needles and syringes. So it's not clear to me that auto-injectors would necessarily be lumped into these terms of needles and syringes. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Except I guess to Josh's point, it, there is a needle and there is a syringe. Yeah. Right. It's just, a, it's just an it's got auto. Drug in it. And really, I, I'm, I'm really asking for a very specific exemption in your regulations because without it, it really has larger implications of how these programs are run and designed and how I answer questions for the public. And really, that's my concern. I, you know, I think before you've had this talk where, you know, the public is going to do what the public is going to do. Not everybody is going to read the signs. Um, but really, this is getting at how these programs are designed and ran and how I can legally answer questions that the public um, is asking me. And so I'm, I'm asking for a very specific exemption that, you know, they're unused, still in its original packaging. And I actually had an expired EpiPen at the office that I meant to bring, and I told, I'm shooting myself in the foot that I did not bring it. So Are you auto-injecting yourself in the yeah. foot? No, no, no. no. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. So, thank um, you. But if we were to make this exception, <laughs> exemption, then we have to change the liner, right? Exactly. The line, according to so what Laura yeah. says, it, the liners are out, and we now got to get a rigid container to put everything in. Unless, uh, I, so I, I think we don't know the answer to that question yet. I think we need to figure out whether you could put a sharps container containing the sharp into the liner, or but I think there's this. I mean, I think there's it a lot won't of. Fit. I mean, yeah. I don't know how you. I don't know if it'll it. fit through the through yeah. the slot and, or not. So. And then uh, if you pull the liner out and start putting things in it, that's a violation of right. where the probably, DE is. Probably there's a market for a small type of sharp plastic cover. I, it seems to me that we kind of need a separate solution for EpiPens, especially especially given their widespread yeah. dispersion in public, because they can't be treated like you know, a needle and syringe. They can't be treated like a drug. They've got special needs. Maybe, I don't, I don't know what the solution and is. And there's that much concern yeah. about epinephrine. I mean, that's <laughs> adrenaline. It's For a sure. common, uh, Amy. I don't know. It's I a know. chemical we all have in our bodies. <laughs> is there's that much concern about epinephrine? So I would, I would make a suggestion to the board, which is um, that I know this is not going to necessarily satisfy, satisfy the city and county of San Francisco, but I, my suggestion would be that the board move through, move forward with the regulation as written for the moment, but that, that we agree that we need to address this issue yeah. by way of whether it's amendment to this regulation or separate regulation, that we need to deal with these auto injectors, uh, EpiPens or others, yeah. to, to allow for their disposal without having to jump, you know, seven leaps and bounds over things. Well, thanks, Josh. Any other public comment? Um, regarding what's going to go in those disposal <coughs> bins, um, the prior commenter said the public is going to do what they're going to do, and they're not going to read the signs. You're not only are you going to get unused auto injectors in there, you're going to get sharps too. Yeah. Yeah. And unless someone from the pharmacy is standing there monitoring every single thing that goes into that bin, um, lots of stuff is going to go in there that shouldn't be in there. And remember Ramon's story about the in, in a, a pharmacy in Chinatown where they actually posted a sign in Chinese that said, um, don't throw your garbage in here. <laughs> so um, I'm just saying, you know, and, and, and no one will know except for the incineration facility what actually ends up in those bins. So until, you know, there's widespread use, someone eventually opens, you know, the bag goes into an incineration Incinerator. I don't know if they throw the whole thing in there or if they open it up or what it is that they do, but I would think that incineration would kill any kind of microbe. I mean, I could be wrong about that, but gee, I mean, incineration is like 450 degrees, isn't it? I don't know. I, if, if there's any environmental people here that want to comment on that, I, I'd love to find out what it is, but... There's going to be a lot of stuff in those bags. Uh, Thanks, Holly. Uh, uh, Amy? Yes. Uh, uh, on those EpiPen, those uh, auto injector, when they come into the pharmacy, they're in a package that you cannot know where you could book yourself or book anybody. So I think it's safe to go to those bins. 
I mean, if you become an original container. Thank you, Albert. Any other public comment? Hello, everybody. Uh, Thomas Good Hare. Uh, I'm great. How are you? I missed you guys last week. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's been a while. It has. I'm here as a staff member of the City of Santa Rosa Water Department. Um, and I just had uh, a few minor uh, clarifying questions for the board. Um, but first, I, I really did want to thank you guys for interacting with us over the last year, or however long it's been. Um, you've been um, very gentle to me in particular. I appreciate that. And I'm actually going to, I am going to miss you guys once this is all done. <laughs> yeah, we still have public you meetings. Still come. Yeah. <laughs> we'll figure out a reason to get you back. Perfect. Um, on 1776.1L, um, I believe, my I's and my L's look a little similar. The last section of 1776.1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My clarifying question is, uh, I just, just want to make sure that it's the board's intent to prohibit pharmacists or pharmacies on probation from distributing mail back envelopes or packages. Is that the board's intent? Yep. That's the intent. Mm -hmm. I think that's the definition of take back services. Yep. Okay. And then on 1776.3B, uh, B as in boy. Um, I, I actually emailed Thomas Provoznik at the DEA for clarification on this point, and he confirmed that, and this is what the DEA does, you guys are allowed to make whatever decisions you want to make on this. But the DEA only required the lack of proximity to areas where emergency or urgent care is provided, and that was specific to hospitals and clinics in the DEA regulation. Now again, you guys can do as you wish with the, with the pharmacies, but my, my clarifying question is, um, what is your intent of saying the, the, that the receptacle can't be in or near emergency areas in pharmacies? What do you mean by near? And what would that mean in a really small pharmacy where you have a door <laughs> And maybe anywhere in the pharmacy would count as being near that door, which technically could be an emergency exit door, um, de depending on what the situation was. So I just wanted to, to get... Um, That's probably an area that we can probably address with guidance, because I believe that when this was written, the emergency area was referred... The emergency areas referred to the DEA's definition of emergency areas. That's which correct. Is, which is areas where emergency care is provided. So that's probably something we can clarify with guidance. Yes. Great. Thank you. I just wouldn't want to add a hurdle that, you know, there's going to be a lot for pharmacies to figure out. I wouldn't want that to be something You're, you're thinking it may mean that there's a, an emergency exit and you can't put it near there? Is that what you're concerned? Well, some staff comment from the Board of Pharmacy had talked about emergency areas in pharmacies being, uh, that which was the first that I'd ever heard of an emergency area in a pharmacy, that maybe that, that meant an emergency exit door. That was no. surprising to me. That would be in me. the back of the pharmacy, I would yeah. think, is, is what it would mean to yeah. most of us in the room. And... You shouldn't be having the public back there. It's the last place that you would want a collection bin. Yeah. Well, maybe not the last place, but certainly among the last places. Yeah. And, and that, that portion of the regulation is actually limited to hospitals and clinics with right. the pharmacy exactly. on the premises. So we're not talking about a community pharmacy. Correct. Here. We're exactly. talking about well, in the DEA, absolutely. But in the, in the, in the Board of Pharmacy reg, um, it, it's talking about the part with pharmacies, I think, as well. No, no, it's just, it's, you're it's talking about C. It's saying yeah. in hospitals and clinics B. with a pharmacy no, on the pharmacy. No, he's talking about B. B, Josh. Oh, okay, Unfortunately, it says in B, not located in or near emergency I areas. See. And that's my, that's okay. my. Um, I got you. Yeah. I can see the confusion. Yeah. Um, and then the, the last um, small point that I wanted to raise was 1776.4A with the skilled nursing facilities. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe this can just be some clarification that you guys could provide as well. Um, I just, I know that you struck part of that portion, um, but I was still confused. It says the pharmacy shall require skilled nursing facility employees to keep records, and it goes on. And it just isn't clear to me um, when that would apply. What, what happens if the skilled nursing facility is distributing envelopes on their own and they're not working with the pharmacy is there still some miraculous pharmacy that's supposed to show up and, and have jurisdiction over the, that record keeping? It just I just wasn't clear from what, what, what that meant exactly. Um, but those were my, my minor things that I wanted to raise to the board. But thank you so much for working with us through this. Thank you. And please feel free to come back. Thanks. 
Any other public comment? Good afternoon, Angie. Hi there. Good afternoon. Um, my comments will be brief. Um, Angie Minetti here on behalf of the California Retailers Association. I uh, want to support the staff recommendation and also the motion that's on the table today. Um, understand that there has been extensive dialogue, lots of time that uh, the board has invested in this, um, in speaking and engaging with various stakeholders at, um, on all ends of the spectrum here. Also, um, the, the level of uh, review and interaction that your staff has had with all stakeholders as well has been truly extensive and I think that the product that we have before us today and the regulations is one that's very much respective of that dialogue of um, of all of the work of uh, stakeholders involved in this space so certainly appreciate um, the time and the thoughtfulness here and would like to um, lend our support to this thank, thank you. you thank you Andy. any other public comment oh Good afternoon, Brian. Good afternoon. Brian Warren with the California Pharmacists Association. We also would like to support the motion, uh, thank the board for all the work you've done. I think this is a long time coming. We're pleased to be able to implement a statewide <coughs> universal uh, take back standard. Um, and I, I would say that as an association that represents several thousand pharmacists, we have not heard about pharmacists being confused with this board's regulations. Thank you. We do hear about pharmacists being confused with some regulations and times, but nothing on this one. Um, and, and I think I'd just like to mention that there's two concerns among pharmacists with take back, uh, hosting take back uh, receptacles. The, a, a key one of those has been the civil liability associated with doing so, and we were pleased to work with uh, Senator Jackson this year to help address one of those concerns or help encourage pharmacies. Another has been with some of the physical limitations associated with certain uh, pharmacy locations and I think that this board's regulations have addressed that potential concern. So we do thank you um, and look forward to hopefully encouraging pharmacists to uh, host collection receptacles. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Any other public comment? Okay, we have a motion on the table and we have a second. And the motion, I am assuming, Stan, since it's your motion, is going right. to include the executive officer language Absolutely. that's included in the packet? Yes. Okay. All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, unanimous. Um, but I do think we need to keep working on the EpiPen yeah. thing. Right. Exactly. I, I don't and I don't think it's just Epi. I think we need to look at at, at, yeah, at shots, any yeah. or even yeah. drugs with sh that are dispensed in a yeah. syringe formulation. Okay. Well, I will make sure that's on the agenda for the next right. enforcement meeting. Okay. All right. And we do we have a, a response back about the other section from our oh, enforcement staff? Oh, let me look. Staff? I was so busy listening, I didn't pay attention. If not, do we have lunch here? It's coming. Okay, so let's move on. Um, let's start on with Communication and Public Ed Committee. Victor? Okay, thank you, Amy. Well, I'm sorry I stand between you guys and the lunch. So. <laughs> well, the lunch isn't here. You're Believe not standing anywhere. Believe me, we'll interrupt anywhere. you when it's time for lunch. <laughs> I will try to be brief. Okay, so this is the uh, report, report of the report. Communication and Public <laughs> Education <laughs> Committee, <laughs> held September 8, 2016. And my committee members consist of uh, me being the chair, Debbie Veal, the vice chair, and uh, Ryan Brooks over hold here, on. three members. Victor, can you hold just a second? We're, we're, yes. we're, we're finishing um, about, the, about the 1702. I'm going to have Ann, um, did she did hear back from the enforcement staff. We're going to go back to item seven, which is the proposed regulations on the discipline, on the infraction requirements. So we do, we do receive a number of reports on renewals, but we only open those where there okay, is. He wants you to make sure you have a microphone. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, we, do <laughs> receive, we do receive a number of these reports as part of the renewals. Right now it's on the pharmacist primarily. And we do open up cases where the infractions do include involving drugs or alcohol. So that's primarily where we focus. Thank you. 
So is what is the enforcement staff? Do they believe that there should be a? Do they require a dollar value? I think that was a question that Laura I think had raised. That, I think what their comment is is that if we remove the dollar value or we um, increase it, it will decrease the amount of workload that's associated. We do not open cases on all of them, as Laura indicated. And they did indicate that the average um, infraction amounts that they see are between $500 and $1,000 in terms of the fine amounts. So it will reduce the workload if we don't? Right, because if someone's not reporting it, then we don't know about it to ask them or you know say, oh, no, we're not concerned about this and close it. But they do think that there's valuable information that $500 to $1,000. Um, I, I don't know that their um, discernment may not be that. Yeah, I think that what they're just really saying is that the average fine amount, so 500 definitely we're getting those, um, but the average range seems to be reporting between 500 and 1,000. So if we, instead of, um, you, if you chose to increase the amount to 1,000, you would not be getting any of those below those, but we're only opening and investigating those involving alcohol and drugs. I say leave it the way we have it. Yeah. Leave it at 500? No, 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 the way we voted. Oh, without, without the dollar, yeah. I, without, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of leaning in that direction as well. I haven't had a response back from the manager of the unit, which is where I sent. So. so do we want to go back? So do you want to make a motion, Stan, then? I'll make a motion. Here you go. And I think that was our previous motion, Seven. which is the remove the dollar amount. Yeah. Uh, the uh, under 500. Uh, remove okay, under 500. Thing. And then changing the date to 2017. Yeah, and remove the dollar amount completely. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then right. keep the, the date to 2017 or, right. or modify it for the technicians and the designated representatives. Second. You got it. Thank you. Second. Greg? Okay. Public comment. Okay, all in favor? Mm -hmm. Okay. Public, public comment? We did. Okay. No one, no one had anything. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry. I'm sorry, Victor, you're Hold back on. on. Uh, really quickly. And so do you also want to, assuming that there are no negative comments, do you want to delegate the authority um, to yeah. yes. the yes. to proceed yeah, do, and finalize the Why don't you jump in on this one, Debbie? No, I have a motion. Absolutely. <laughs> Adopt regulatory language is noticed. On Mo August 12, 2016, and the changes you made. This, yeah, right, and 17. And delegate the, uh, uh, yeah. the notice, it was notice on right. 12, 16. Um, so with the changes. With the changes he made. And delegate to the executive officer the authority to make technical and non-substantive right. changes as may be required by the OAL or Department of Consumer Affairs. Very awesome. Is that what you meant to say? Took the words <laughs> out of my mouth. And I meant Laura, to second Laura, do we need to revote again? Also. Yeah. Okay, second, Greg, on that one. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, unanimous. All right, Victor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. No problem. All right. Uh, Thank you for concluding your report. <laughs> Greg must be really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I am fast, isn't even but not here fast. He's us out. <laughs> Uh, a copy of the minutes from the meeting on September the 8th is provided in attachment 10. So if you guys are interested in look at the whole thing. But I'd just like to mention this one item, which is the discussion of the final rule implementing section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act regarding non-discrimination in health programs and activities, especially uh, the impact on pharmacy translations and interpretation. Now that item has been scheduled to a committee meeting December the 1st, so you will not see in my report today. December the 1st? December 14th? December 14, I'm sorry. December 4th, December 14 in Sacramento. Anybody who is interested? Glendale. Is that a kind of funny? Which Yeah. That's Glendale. That's Glendale. It's in Glendale. Jeez. We got a deluxe place for you for that one. Good. I don't have to travel. Yeah. Hop, skip, and jump. Great. Living room. Exactly. Okay. So let's move on to item A. It's, this is an action item. Is the update and discussion on the development of a revised patient consultation survey questionnaire. Uh, let me give you a little background. At the October 2015 board meeting, President Gutierrez asked the committee to develop a survey for licensees about patient consultation. At the May 2016 Communication and Public Ed Committee meeting, 
The Division of Program and Policy Review Chief Tracy Montes of the Department of Consumer Affairs addressed the committee and her office the ability to de develop the patient consultation survey for the board's licensees. And at the September 2016 committee meeting, the committee discussed the advantages of the board funding an additional survey. Now, board staff provided the committee with a rough estimates from the DCA approximately 15,000 to 20,000 plus an addition a dollar per pharmacist survey. So the DCA recommend surveying about 10,000 to 20,000 pharmacists. So the committee discussed the importance of ensuring patient consultation is provided to the patient. However, they also expressed hesitation in the survey being the most effective instrument used to increasing patient consultation. And the committee also discussed various means to ensure patient consultation, including licensing and enforcement measures. Now, I'm not going to go into full detail of each committee member, what said and whatnot, but uh, down to the bottom, uh, the committee recommended that the board redirect this subject of patient consultation to the licensee committee, recommend that the licensing committee focus on regulations that could be streamlined to increase pharmacist availability for consultations, and recommended that no surveys be conducted because of the high fee. And additionally, the committee recommend canceling this pharmacy survey by the DCA. And this is the committee recommendation to the board. Uh, board members comment. I think that's a good thing because. Microphone. Yeah, I just want to comment that I think that's a good thing because at the end of the day, most of we've already heard that most of the pharmacists say it's because of uh, a lack of time because they are just, you know, just they're just too busy. And so I don't I don't think we need to do a survey. Thank you, Cheryl. Any other members uh, yeah, comment, and, and, Brian? And, and, and thank you for uh, you know, taking the leadership on this. But I think you know, as a board, as a subcommittee, we all felt that this is such a really important issue um, for us. Uh, consultation, I think, is the, the benchmark to uh, have you know, healthy patients and healthy public. The surveys that we've looked at in the past and the, uh, the, the current survey that we're uh, talking about today pretty much had the same theme. You know, we don't have the time and too many regulations. And so the thought process behind our committee was, well, you know, maybe we should move this to a different a committee to look at what regulations might help ease the burden on the pharmacists so we could have uh, these um, consultations take place in a more efficient uh, manner. And I, I think this is an area we haven't reviewed yet. And that's why we thought it might be good to move this down to the Regula Regulations Committee. Licensing. I think we said licensing. Oh, oh, yes. licensing yes. Committee. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think Cheryl's right. I think we all know it's an issue. We just need to figure out a way and how to address it. So that I mean, I, I interview pharmacists all the time, and they tell me that they are in situations where they've got little codes, color codes on their computer, and if they take too long counseling somebody, their screen turns red. And they are green or, or whatever color, and they really? cannot. Yeah, they're they're count. They basically have so much time to process a prescription, and if it's like you're on a treadmill, and if you don't get it done in that amount of time, mm -hmm. then and you counsel someone too long, you now go into the red, and you're going to affect your bonus on your farm for the pharmacist. So oh, nice. I'm I'm concerned. I, I agree with Cheryl. I think we all know it's an issue. I don't know a survey is going to really tell us much more than that. And I think that that was really the conclusion of the, the committee. Can. We were, you know, we were hoping we could easily get another survey out that would be more defensible if we needed mm -hmm. it. But so. yeah, after looking, it was it was just going to delay everything, and we Great. thought that was just so. Not they're only allowed many consultations. Is that the deal? <laughs> sure. There are. I think what what I hear, and I just I asked them about it. There's only a certain amount of time that they have yeah. to finish the process, yeah, which includes from the moment of checking the prescription all the way down to counseling well, the patient. HMOs so they get used to do up. that with doctors. They only gave them X amount of minutes yeah. to be with a patient. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other board members comment? Mm. Uh, public comments. 
If not, now we do have actually to be two motions. One motion is directed to the licensing committee, and the second motion is to recommend canceling the survey by DCA. So okay. This and is a, this is the committee. It's, it's a committee recommend. Uh, committee. You don't need a second. So yeah, so we don't need so a second. We can just vote on it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, all those in favor of the first committee recommendation is to refer that to the licensing committee. Please raise your hand. Re refer the issue of pharmacist consultation. Okay. Consultation. Okay, pass. Thank you. Well, and can I more qu clarification? It's not necessarily pharmacist consultation. It's the regulations that might impede pharmacist consultation. That's correct. Right. Okay. Thank Very. you. Thank you for the amendment, Ryan. <laughs> okay, the second motion is to recommend canceling this pharmacist survey by this DCA because of the cost. So all those in favor, please raise your hand. I'm sorry. Okay. I told you we, we did. You. Okay. okay. I, Very good. Thank I you. Sorry open about up for that. public comment before. Thank you so much. And the only thing I would change is the motion from the committee did not say it was because of cost. It was just yeah. so we wanted to yeah. cancel it. Cancel it. Agreed. Okay. Right. Yeah. So all those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed. Abstain. The motion carried. Agenda B on. Update and discussions on development of FAQs received from Ask the Inspector at DCA.gov. The licensees continue to be able to call and ask general questions of pharmacy inspectors. Inspectors answer calls on Tuesday and Thursday from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. In addition, the licensees may submit an email inquiry to an inspector as the s.inspector at dca.ca.gov. Now, board staff, in concert with legal counsels, develop a series of FAQ, including the most frequent questions and issues posed to the inspector during that time. And a copy of the FAQs posted on the board's, board's website can be found at attachment one. Now, these FAQs are not intended as nor should they be construed to be legal advice. The information is intended to provide guidance to the reader on relevant legal sections that should be considered when using professional judgment to determine an appropriate course of action. Should a licensee require legal advice or detailed research, the licensee is encouraged to contact an attorney or other source. Uh, any other board members comment on this? You know, uh, even though uh, the but, well, anyway, I've had a number of comments uh, made to me that the time that that is taken to get back to to get a good answer uh, for the uh, requester has been uh, very inconvenient for the for the pharmacist. I don't, I don't know how accurate that is, but I have gotten that. Uh, Does it take less time to get a bad answer? Well, they might be the same. The well, <laughs> well, yeah. inconvenient, Alan. like too long. Ta taking too long. The problem uh, has is uh, exacerbated by Al the, by the time they get it back. In yes. in yeah. response to your questions, I personally called that number yesterday myself. Uh -huh. Okay, so I called. It was it only takes me a minute and a half, and they direct me to the inspector right away. So that's great. But 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 but, the, but I do have a question actually. So I, to the inspector? I, I just say I'm a pharmacist and I call the number that nine one six five seven four seven nine zero zero and I call it to the operator and I ask, is this the number I could talk to a pharmacy inspector? And she says, Oh, okay. She wrote it down and she forwarded me and to, you got the to inspector. An inspector. I got it through to inspector. So it's happening. If you guys have questions call between really? Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, th I think that's that wonderful that you, I, I think that's wonderful that you, that you got through. I, I, I find that admirable. But, uh, you know, often, often, oftentimes when we're, when people, when pharmacists call, they're asking a, for a clarification on a point and so, or understanding. <coughs> And so they didn't get the right answer. Th no, no, no. Oh, it, the, the, the answer is taking too long to get back. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't have so that problem. Actually, I depend on the nature of the of what it is. I mean, if it's a straightforward question, 
They shouldn't be they, gone. They should, well, n n that, that would be perhaps our thought, yeah. but the reality is, is that if it's a straightforward question, I would hope that the inspectors can answer it. But sometimes it requires research, yeah. and that's the problem. Yeah. If the question is truly innovative, and we don't have policy in the area, or they're going to have to look a little bit, they spend a lot of time sometimes yeah. responding to these, and the email that they get, I'm assuming part of that's an email and not necessarily, I heard somehow or another I took your, um, the, the contact to the, to the ask an inspector came in as email because I know that the email stays with them. They, they can't pass that off to somebody else. What, what comes on the week that they're doing inspector duty stays with them and they have to respond. Now, if people aren't <coughs> responsive, that's a complaint that should come to me. But there's a point at which recognize that we can't go out doing some of this legal research that we're being asked to do because I have seen some of the inquiries and they and the staff has been trained to come to me if they're asking for a legal issue. Yeah, Jenny, uh, I was just going to say my experience and I've had people that I've referred both to the phone number and to the email. In both cases, they thought they got at, you know um, a response very quick. Matter of fact, one time they emailed at like you know six o'clock and they said that. The inspector was obviously checking email because they got an answer back like that evening. So we don't have an understaffed yeah. situation. Yeah. Then. But um, the one complaint I got was because someone was asking, really wanted legal advice. No. And the no. inspector you know, said, here's the reg, you need to ask your attorney. And so uh, the person kind of pushed back again. No, no, I, I want you to tell me. And so yeah. that's the only advice. And so they called me and I said, yeah, I kind of agree with the inspector. That, that's a legal decision that you need to make as an owner. And so you need to, you know, pick up the phone and call your attorney that that's not the job of our inspector uh, is right. to, you know, mm -hmm. be your attorney, is, you know, give you legal advice. Uh, uh, Jeannie, do you have any uh, statistic how many call we have a day? Uh, how many questions, how many call come in, or many, do do yeah. we, is it is such a high demand, do we need to expand the hour or the days, you know, if it's a high demand for it? I don't know whether or not that that's occurring. I'm not sure how long it's taking to respond because the inspectors pretty much have a week to do this. They're, they're assigned to the phone lines and to do the inspector for a week, and then the work stays with them. Most of them attempt to get that done but within the week. How many with, within the week, yeah, the unit is counting calls, yeah. and it's not just necessarily the inspector themselves because we have other staff, our complaint handlers, mm -hmm. also handle some of the inquiries before it gets to an inspector. But the stats we we've had them and we've reported them at prior meetings. I just don't <coughs> have them with me now. So, so do you think the high demand or is uh, I mean something you can handle or if it's, uh, do we need more time slot for that purpose? Well, if the suggestion is, can we put more people on the phone lines, we could put more people on the phone lines, but that means it's going to slow our investigation times, which aren't fast enough as it what, is. What kind My of question is, is there any use? demand for that? Yeah. Um, I don't know, but I'm not yeah, aware that there's a problem with being totally yeah. unresponsive yeah. or else those calls, like I said, those need to come to yeah. me. Yeah. And we've got people that monitor the call volume and the, and the response time. That information is set up to come to me if there's a problem. Let us know in a few So I'm not aware of it. So do they use disclaimers all the time when they answer? Pardon uh, me? Do they use disclaimers a lot of time when they answer? So What would be a, no, the disclaimer words, flat out is we don't give legal advice, here's the code section. That's strictly it. And I've so. gotten some pretty esoteric questions that have been routed to me and including occasionally, we do get aggressive responses occasionally where I ask this question, I need an answer now. Hmm. That isn't necessarily the most compulsive or <laughs> kind way to get us to just let me just do yeah, it right say, now okay, for we'll you. Give you an answer, um, but you can't. If I can make that. just an observation about this, and and I don't know that there's any way to control for this, but um, I I think the goal of this program is to provide on the job pharmacists and pharmacy owners with you know real right. world information. Right. Unfortunately, what tends to happen is that we get a a large number of attorneys oh, <laughs> asking <laughs> arcane legal, though I know only because they tend to get routed to me you when get, they you get yeah. some of the ones um, I can't answer. That. I mean, I don't know how, what percentage of the questions that represents. It may be a small fraction of them, but I, I, those are the ones that I tend to see. So I know that, and I don't know if we want to have a like, we won't answer attorney questions rule or if we want to like, I mean, maybe it's just addressed by saying we won't ask, answer legal questions. 
But I just wanted the board to be aware that that's part of what's driving some of the, the call or question volume is, is people who have legit, I'm not saying their questions aren't legitimate, but they're just, there are questions that we're not going to answer, particularly well, for attorneys. Well, it's for yeah. us to be answering. Yeah. Yeah. I think Just tell your attorney I'm friends not to call. <laughs> <laughs> They're no friends of mine. <laughs> but, you know. So, to kind of bring it back, so your agenda item, I think, where you're at is on the discussion and development of FAQs. Yeah. Right? So, I think that's where Okay. We're but anyway, um, this is a big step forward. Imagine in the old days, you, you guys never get a chance to call the board. So I think we should be happy the way we are right now. Right. Okay, there's, of course, there's also rooms for improvement. So I was informed by the staff that as we get more phone calls, they, they will update the mm -hmm. FAQs uh, besides what you have seen on this attachment one. I so think that's the good news. Good. I think that's a great thing because before we didn't have anything. Yeah. Now we have two days that they can call in. I've called in. I've known other pharmacists to call in, and they all uh, say good things about the, the response. So obviously their questions were pharmacy. You know, they, they weren't legal questions. They were something that they can answer pretty fast. And I think the FAQs is really good because then you won't get as many calls. Well, and it's Maybe. two days on the <laughs> phone, but really that um, the email... Mm -hmm. That's like 24/7. Yeah. I mean, yeah. not that they're going to get responded 24/7, but they can, you know, they can reach out and get a hold of. And like I said, my experience is they're getting answers really quick yeah. on the yeah. on the email. Uh, a genie. Yes, they definitely are. Right. A genie. Can we put on the on a message when they call that number? Say no legal questions. Mm -hmm. You know, specify ahead of time so they don't go into yeah, that. We detail. should have a general disclaimer on yeah. on the website yeah. or something we, stating that. We tell them that, yeah. that it's not. This is not going to be legal advice. Yeah. Um, but but again, our intent is to try to get people to the code section because our law is so complex. If we can get them to the right code section, mm -hmm. that that kind of helps them pro be provided with the information they need in order to at least start addressing where they need to go. Because it it's it is our law is confusing and it's very complex. And I just got an interesting e inquiry from the legislature, so somebody's watching us. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. and I'll just I'll just point out that there's one slight. There's, I mean, I think it's a very minute risk, but there's a, there's a small risk associated with the ask duty inspector or ask an inspector, which is that we occasionally have cases, and you've probably seen some of these, in which uh, persons who are subsequently subject to some action, whether it's citation or, or mm -hmm. will claim that they did something in reliance on right. being advised of same by, mm -hmm. by an inspector. Um, now, that could happen in ordinary out-in-the-field inspections. So I don't think the duty inspector, you know, it's only a marginal increase in that risk, but there is that slight possibility that, you know, this will increase the number of times that people say, well, I called the board and they told me that this was just fine for me to, you know, hand out. Do the inspectors document the calls and the responses? The, well, that's what I was going to. That's what I was, I, I don't know the answer to that question. So yeah, procedurally, sure. I don't know how these calls are documented. The FAQs are developed mm -hmm. based on mm -hmm. the questions that are received and the responses that we provide. And we try to standardize the responses that we, res that, that we provide, and those are memorialized in the FAQs. But so, in terms of individual interactions, are, is there any kind of call log or, right. or record recording so of those? We memorialize them and we use the information that we get when we're receiving calls to develop the FAQs. No, but if somebody, the question is, if somebody tries to claim that they relied on a specific uh, statement that was made to them, do we have a documentation on the call and what response was given? Only if it's an email. Okay. Otherwise, it's oral and they move on, probably. So there may be probably, some that, that write notes. Can but, we record but it? Can we have a recording of Sure, we can, we can go ahead and record it, but again, it's just what somebody, if you record it, then somebody's going to have to sort it, then somebody's going to have to aggregate it, then somebody's going to have to do something with it. So 
Once more, we're talking about the FAQs. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, we want to get back to the we'll FAQs that uh, develop out of the. Um, oh, out of Laura, the you're just ruining everything. As opposed to the Ask Inspector General. <laughs> but, but Jeannie, could we suggest that before that pharmacists being connected to the inspector, they should hear this disclaimer about. That's what I said. About yeah. First. This only take about 30 seconds. They can yeah. hear that the advice yes. are given That's is not on a legal basis. Absolutely. I don't know. Do we have a disclaimer that comes up before we talk to anybody saying that this is yeah. not legal advice? Don't I, rely I, on it I, for I anything. You be. take this at your own risk. Is that? Well, we should. Uh, because, we should. We should. Yes, can I ask yeah. a quick question? Yeah, yeah Brian. Is this a solution in search of a problem? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I'm just not here. This is a, I mean, we're having a lot of debate, a lot of discussion about this. I'm not here that this is a problem. So well, it, it, it was be, not uh, a problem, and the process has been working efficiently for, you know, since we implemented the program. I'm not quite <laughs> sure what we're trying to fix. I agree with Ryan. Let's just move forward. Okay. Well, All right. I guess the question is, how, how many times, Josh, do people try to rely, say that they're relying on this? For well, I, I mean, action? I think the better question is, how many times are they successful in doing so? And to my knowledge, the answer is zero. Okay. <laughs> then Ryan's Just right. tell them to contact their attorney. Okay. Any public comments on the FAQs? Seeing none? Okay. Then we'll move on. I, uh, item number C is also FYI. Discussion and consideration of naloxone related matters. Item one, communication to the California Healing Art Board regarding naloxone. The background, at the previous committee meetings, committee members have expressed interest in reaching out to California Healing Art Board regarding naloxone access and the regulations and protocol. The board staff recently developed an article about pharmacists and naloxone to be shared with the other California Healing Art Board including the Medical Board of California, the Board staff. of Registered Nursing, Dental Board of California, Dental Hygiene Committee of California, California State Board of Optometry, Osteopathic Medical Board of California, Physician Assistant Board, California Board of Podiatric Medicine, the Veterinary Medical Board, the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians. A copy of the article and transmittal letter is included in attachment two. So you could tell that we did communicate with all the other boards and this have been done. Uh, item two on the Laloxone FAQs. At previous committee meetings, committee members have expressed the need for Naloxone FAQ. So board staff drafted Naloxone FAQs in concert with legal counsel. The Naloxone FAQs are posted on the board website. And a copy of this FAQ is included in that attachment too. So if anybody have questions also on the naloxone, they could check on the board website. Uh, any committee board members comment on this subject? Do we have, uh, we do have liability protection on this, right? So that if, let's say that a pharmacy dispenses a naloxone, somebody uses it, and there's a negative result, or it doesn't do what they hope it would do. Um, is the, does the legislation uh, have a protection in there against liability on the part of the pharmacy? I think that's why you have errors and emissions insurance. I, that would well, be between, that. we're not involved in that, I don't think. Okay, I just want to, because I know on some of the. Oh, that's one for we got two attorneys sitting here. Or is that? Good uh, it's Samaritan? not typical. It's not typical for there to be liability protection built into particular. But sometimes there is. Actually, but occasionally, it. yeah. But. But as far as you know, there isn't any. Other I don't. Story. I'm not aware that there is a specific one in this case. Okay. All right. Any other uh, board members comments? <laughs> if seeing none, any public comments? Okay, let's move on to item three. It's also FYI only. There's SB 833, Committee on Budget and Fiscal Review, Health Chapter 30, Statutes of 20 and 2016. The committee discussed SB 833, which is the Committee on Budget and Fiscal Review, Health Chapter 30, Statutes 2016. That requires the California Department of Public Health to award funding to local health departments, local governments agency, or on a competitive basis to community-based organizations, the regional opioid prevention coalitions, or both, to support 
or establish programs that provide naloxone to first responders and to at-risk OPR users through programs that serve at-risk drug users, including syringe exchange and disposal programs, homeless programs, and substance use disorder treatment providers. There is approximately $3 million available from this law, but the board is not eligible to apply for the funding. Now, pharmacists that want to provide naloxone, they should contact to the Department of Public Health for this funding. Um, the board also will disseminate information via the subscriber alerts when this information is available on how to apply for the funding. So this is a FYI for pharmacists, pharmacies who want to apply for the funding. Um, any uh, board members comment? Any public comments? No, if not, then the, let's move do on we, to... Do we know if the $3 million, is that an annual thing? or is Nope, that one time. One time. They're still working out the provisions by which it'll be distributed as of a week ago. They were still working that out. Okay. Uh, we will share once we have any more information so pharmacies can Thank have you. access to the money. But yeah, they're looking at Northern California for the most part. And they will po be posted on the website for the public. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it up there and Thank share it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, item number four. We're F also talking about doing a subscriber alert. We did. We would send, we'd help send it out because we think it would be of value to pharmacies to know that there's okay. a funding source to provide naloxone. For item number four, discussions on federal legislation US S524, Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act of 2016. On July 22, 2016, President Obama signed into law US S524, known as the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act of 2016, in an effort to combat the national epidemic of prescription opioid abuse and heroin use. A copy of the Atlantic Law was included in Attachment, one, attachment 2. Uh, Sub-item number 1, Lali's Law. Lali's Law was passed by the House by the vote of 415 to 4 on May 12, 2016. And the bill was signed into law as part of the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act of 2016 on July 22, 2016. Lali's Laws increases access to Lenoxone throughout the United States. The bill is named in memory of Alex Laliberte, an Illinois resident who passed away seven years ago from a drug overdose. Now, the committee also discussed how Lali's Laws creates a competitive grant program that will help states increase access to Lenoxone. The primary purpose of the grant is to fund state programs that allow pharmacists to distribute naloxone without a prescription. Now, many states use these programs to allow local law enforcement officers to carry and use naloxone. Uh, so let me give you a recent updates. Uh, the law also authorized CDCs to award grants to the state to encourage pharmacies to dispense medication that reverse opioid overdoses. The board staff contacted the congressman, though legislative assistant, who responded the Department of Health and Human Assistance will implement the Lolly's Law grant programs. But the assistant was unaware which sub-agency or department would actually carry it out. Now, she also indicated she would advise board staff when additional information is available. And a copy of this press release from Congressman Doe's office announcing the Lolly's Law is included in attachment two. So if anybody is interested in reading the whole uh, law's provisions, uh, please do so. And any comments from the board members on this? Uh, Victor? Yes. This law only involves the naloxone, but in, not anything that uh, recovery program like the, to, oh, for, the, the for the addict we recovery program, they don't have any we money for that. Like that yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Not that I'm aware of. But do we have, currently have in California any recovery law? I mean, for drug addict? We have, there, there are various treatment programs therapy. that are set up through yeah. SAMHSA and other places to do it. This was a specialized law that came but out. But even though I'm as a pharmacist, coming pharmacy, I don't even know those, uh, where exists, where, where's available for them, for us to refer those addicts to. 
Yeah. yeah that's so I think that's something that we should uh, look into. There I mean, because well, that's an epidemic on the narcotics. So I mean, the governors. Uh, I think one time when I saw him, he would ask me, he "Say, is that bad out there?" As I say, "Is that bad?" So I think he's concerned about that. Uh, so I think we talk about all this law and regulation, but we don't have any place for those addicts to go to get recover, to clean up. So I think it's something we should look into. It's, it's a big issue. Is, is there anything, uh, on the naloxone, I would assume that uh, whenever it's given out, there are uh, specific instructions and warnings and so on on how to use it? Because it's my understanding that, you know, if people use that, um, it's not like just use it and it's over. You have to go to the hospital afterwards. Uh, it can throw you into a, a uh, you know, withdrawal, right. all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm just wondering what kind of safeguards there are when they, if this stuff is passed out to like law enforcement and various people that don't have previous training on how to use it. Well, I suspect that EMS is providing training to their staff so that they know how to use it. In the case of pharmacists, under our protocol, and keep in mind we're further along than what Lolly's Law provides for um, federally, our, our pharmacists have to consult the recipient or whoever the individual is that's getting the medication right. or the, the naloxone, and they're not allowed to waive the consultation. They have to go through it. So the goal is, as part of that consultation, you educate the patient mm -hmm. what you have to do and that it's not okay to just give the um, overdose medication and then tell the person to go home and go to sleep. But you it, need to get them into some kind of emergency right. response. But it seems to me that, you know, so let's say a um, police officer goes in and gets one, get, gets a packet or something. And then they go back and they uh, put it in the department, and you know anybody basically can grab it and use it. How do we make sure? Not that our issue. Yeah, that's that's, that's in the control of the police department. Yeah, I was going to say it's not in our jurisdiction or purview under mm -hmm. the yeah. board. Yeah. If someone's it's walking into a pharmacy and picking it up, it's probably excuse me, it's probably our issue. But yeah, but right. but but again. We don't we don't control all of this. I mean, we've got a whole there are emergency responders that are out there with naloxone, and they're you have to think that they've been trained on how to use it like they are to train yeah. to respond to any emergency. And like they're schools asked to and so on there. as well. Yeah, well, the schools now can have it, yeah. and there's a mechanism in place to educate them too. And EpiPen, you know, it's a similar situation, yeah. Yeah. which is being now we're talking about oh, uh, requiring restaurants to have yes. you know, EpiPen and. Yeah, I, re I know that. Yeah. So, but your point is well taken, but... Understood. Can't, can't cover everything. <coughs> okay, let's see if there's any public comments regarding this Dali's Law. Any public comments? Seeing none. Uh, let's move on to item two, on the provisions regarding partial fields for Schedule 2s. Now, the committee discussed potential conflict between Section 702F2A2 of the CARA and California law. The board staff is seeking directions of legal counsel and will provide an update of the board meeting. And the committee also discussed the issue should be brought to the attention of the pharmacists by the board, such as article in the script of the Winter Section 2016 and 17 edition. The board staff will work on developing an article for the Winter edition of the script. And so you guys have a supplemental sheet over here I provide oh, by the staff regarding this uh, Schedule 2. Um, because um, pursuant to the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act of 2016, um, there would be another situation when partial filling of Schedule 2 controlled substance would be allowed, provided the prescription is a valid prescription and the pharmacist exercises their corresponding responsibility when filling a controlled substance prescription. It's requested by the patient or practitioner with no refill after 30 days from date written. Uh, from a terminal ill patient marked as terminal ill intended within, intended within a 60 day from the date issue and no more dispensing after 60 days from the date of issue. And for long-term care facility patient marked as LTCF, tender within 60 days from the day issue, and no more dispensing after 60 days from the day of issue. So when a pharmacist 
doesn't have enough or dispense a partial with a balance within 72 hours. I think so. The, the issue is like 30 days or six months that the, the difference between the California law and, the, and, the, and this federal uh, CARA law. And is there, a, uh, Debbie, is there an update on, um, on this, uh, the issue? Is this I'll be memorializing and putting something into the newsletter so that guidance yeah. can be disseminated. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, comments from the board members on this? Public, any questions on this particular issue? Seeing none, let's move on to item D. Discussion on the developments of FAQs for SB 493 related items. At the April 2016 board meeting, the board requested that the Communication Ed Committee coordinate the development of a FAQs for SB 493 related items. So at the September 2016 Public Ed Committee meeting, the board staff reported the draft was under legal review and posted on the board website as soon as possible. So, uh, Debbie, is this still under review? Well, yeah, we actually had to pull it back from legal review and make some updates to it. So it'll be back in legal review by the end of the week. So it's not on the website yet? Nope. Okay. Uh, any comments from the board members? From the public? But they will be post after they've been reviewed. So you, if you have questions about all these SB 493 provisions, all the FAQs, look it up on the board website as soon as they have it up. Okay, item E, also FYI, discussion on the CE courses available for naloxone, self-administered hormonal contraception, and nicotine replacement therapy under protocols. The committee members review a chart summarizing options for CE that are available specific to naloxone, self-administered hormonal contraception, and nicotine replacement therapy under protocols. The committee concurred the chart should be updated to reflect the training required prior to initiation of the protocol and show any continuing education required if applicable. And the board staff also update the chart and will seek legal approval and post to the board's website. As part of the update, the board staff will include the vaccination protocol. A copy of this update chart is included in attachment three. So if you guys look at attachment three, you'll see the comparison of the CE required. Um, any comments from board members? Any public comment? Seeing none, let's move on to item F. Update and discussions on resources available on the board's, board's website. At prior meetings, the committee reviewed multiple items for posting on the board's website as resources for consumers and licensees. At the May 2016 meeting, the committee directed board staff to develop a draft policy for posting resources on the board's website and bring back to the committee. The board staff consulted with other boards within the DCA and state agencies and drafted the California State Board of Pharmacy website guidelines. The need for the policy statement arose because the board received general requests to post items on the board's website. Committee members agree that the draft policy is a good place for the board to start and see how it works and make changes as necessary. So the committee directs staff to move forward with the policy and post on the board's website. A copy of the policy has been added to the board's website and can be found in attachment four. So if you guys want to know the standard policy on posting stuff on the website, you can see on item four, attachment four. Any Comments from board members? Any comments from the public? Seeing none, let's move on to item G. Okay, this is exciting. This is an action item, okay, that will wake you up. <laughs> 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 Discussion of a board developed a billboard message and related communication material. So in your folder, okay, please everybody look up your little folder there. There is a billboard sign right there. there, there there are two of them 
Okay. I like number one, I don't like number two. <laughs> be patient, be patient, Alan. <laughs> we'll, we'll go to that. Now, through the efforts and action of our board member, Ryan Brooks, now the committee revealed the concept of a roadside bulletin board message and related communication materials. Now, these are the two billboard message to encourage parents to talk to their children about prescription drug abuse. Now, the draft concept were developed by the staff at Mr. Brooks' firm. The first draft include drawings of the pills around the message, and attended drugs are the leading killer of kids. And then the second one featured kid killer with capital letters superimposed on a prescription drug pill. So after discussing, I'm with Alan. <laughs> <laughs> I understand it's a Xanax book. Yeah, it's a Xanax or something. I like one. I don't like Xanax two. So this is an action item. Okay, the the um, the committee would uh, would like to motion and move the concept with this. I, I think we all agree. We like we like this one. The, uh, like the one, the first number one. Huh? Yeah, yeah, number one, and also. At the bottom, it will have a message that is sponsored by the California Board of Pharmacy. So everyone who look it up know that this is Good. a message sponsored by the Board of Pharmacy. Nice. And courtesy of Ryan Brooks, I think this is a huge step forward. Are we going to put see. that courtesy of Ryan Brooks? Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that's missing from it is the board's logo and any kind of direction to someplace else. So I think we need to do, be a little bit more refined yeah. Yeah. before it goes up. And I will be happy to work with your staff in that area if that's okay. Uh, thank you. And I, yeah, yeah, this, this thanks, Ryan, for doing this. this and is I think the other thing the committee, and you were going to check in once we got the approval, is is a white billboard the right color? What, what makes it pop more? And, They'll do all that yeah. stuff. But, yeah. This pops pretty well. Thanks for taking the lead in we doing this. Oh, this is right. really important. It's a very good public service. It's yeah, a wonderful. You know, I'm finally glad we were you know, able to do this. You know, One of the things that this board has started with is you know, public safety, and you know, I have you know, two boys. They're 13 and 11 years old, and you know, we're very fortunate that uh, as a family unit, we're very aware of all the different things that you know, teenage kids can get into, mm -hmm. and um, if we can do just one little thing to do our part to bring greater awareness and maybe you know, save just one life out there, I think as a board, we're doing our job. So I would. So, wouldn't we? Wouldn't the board want to write a letter to? Um, Ryan's company and, and acknowledge. I mean, no, no, no need. You know, that's. that's I know just you don't more, think it's needed, but I think it, yeah. I think it's the right. Um, you know, we're just. Uh, it's I think the right the, thing the, to do. Yeah, you know, I appreciate it, and this is the right thing to do. Um, you know, sometimes you do things for the right reasons. Well, you know, wanting any kudos or thanks. Yeah. Um, so we'll work with uh, our executive director to finalize these great piece of locations. Get it up. Mm -hmm. I'll work with the, my counterparts at CBS uh, News and Radio and see if we can get some other earned media with this. And we'll maybe put a our executive director on the cir speaking circuit on TV. Um, she has thousand dollars per parent. Are you my agent? She, she looks much better than I do. So um, yeah, we'll move yeah, forward. And yeah, you know, thank you for it. the board for um, getting this done. Um, Thank you. I think this is really exciting for us to do, and we're real grateful. There is a group working through the Department of Public Health with a number of state agencies. They're looking at running a state campaign, and this seems to fit right into mm -hmm. that, too. This is our campaign, but it also has a state of California impact. So mm -hmm. I like we'll it be too able to blend the two together. It so. looks good, too, because it shows us supporting drug take back. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a, right. It comes at a really good time. You there know? you go. Well, and yeah. it's going to have to link to a web page that's got a bunch of stuff we've already got it set up for prescription drug abuse mm -hmm. we need to tap into that and mm -hmm. pull this thing together so that it becomes a unified public outreach campaign instead of just this isolated billboard sitting somewhere right. so yeah and this is the committee recommendation so any public comments if not uh, all those in favor please raise your hand hey Number one. abstain and motion carry Thank you, Ryan. I think this is big, big, big PR for the for the board. Yeah. Okay, item H, also FYI only. Communication plan for consumers and licensees. In accordance with the board's strategic plan, staff provide the committee members with copies of a draft communication plan that includes aspects for both consumers and licensees. So 
uh, this is just a, a copy of this draft communication plan that's included in attachment six. Um, if you guys like to review the plan, please take a look at it. <laughs> Any comments from uh, board members? Any comments from the public? If Okay, if not, let's move on to item I. Also for FYI only. This is an update and discussions on the 45th Annual Report of the Research Advisory Panel of California for 2015 regarding controlled drugs research. Pursuant to Health and Safety Code Section 11480 and 11481, California law requires proposed research projects using certain opioid stimulants and hallucinogenic drugs is classified as Schedule I and Schedule II controlled substances as the main study drugs to be reviewed and authorized by the Research Advisory Panel of California and the Attorney General's Office. The Research Advisory Panel primarily seeks to ensure the safety and protection of the participating human research subjects and adequate security of the controlled substances used in the study. The panel members evaluate the scientific validity of each proposed project and may reject proposals where the research is poorly conceived. It would produce conclusion of little scientific value or would not justify the exposure of California subjects to the risk of the research. Um, during the 2015, the panel reviewed 45 research study submissions. 43 were approved by the panel. Among the approved studies, 14 studies were academic research <coughs> studies, two studies were substance abuse treatment research protocols, and 27 studies were multi-clinical drug trial research studies. At the end of the 2015, the panel was monitoring 121 research projects. So a copy of this 45th Annual Report of the Research Advisory Panel of the California 2015 is included in Attachment 7, if you'd like to take a look at it. Any board members comment on this subject? Any public members comment? Seeing none, let's move on to Item J. Board Publications, Review and Recommendation for Changes. Number one, that the counterfeit prescription drugs protect yourself, your family, and your pets. And number two, buying prescription medications online are the drugs you buy real or fake. Uh, the committee <coughs> take a look at these two produced publications to determine if the pamphlets should be updated or removed from the publication. Uh, you guys could take a look at it on attachment eight. Now, uh, actually, we talk about it. Uh, I, I, the committee think that the pamphlet actually contained very good information, but perhaps they were not hitting the proper target audience. So we suggested asking the retailer association to distribute the pamphlet to customers while they fill the prescriptions, and they should be made available at board meetings and any speaking presentation. Um, we also would like to see the, the pamphlets be translated into the top five languages and that the pharmacists should be notified that they're available so they could distribute to the customers. Um, and uh, we also suggest, suggest updating the pamphlets to include information on the pharmacy dot domain. Uh, the board staff will work on updating this as for future distributions. Any board members comment? Any public comments? So, uh, uh, Angie, since you're from the Retailing Association, could we suggest that you could help out with the distribution of these pamphlets to the customers? Would you guys have any um, issue with it? Hi, Victor. Um, Hi. So, you know, typically our members are certainly open to providing more educational materials. Um, you know, we're already uh, doing that with some of the drug take back efforts as well. So, um, you know, obviously uh, we're going to uh, take a look at the materials that are being provided, whatever is finalized. And, um, you know, I, I think our members would be open to it, but I'll, I'll definitely take it back to them for their consideration. Thank, thank you. Especially, I think, internet. I, I think a lot of consumers are confused about what internet, whether they're legal, what mm -hmm. suit, and they should not do. And if we put prescription for customers, it would be helpful if you guys could distribute some of this information to the public. 
Thank, thank, thank you for you. your cooperation. So they are, they are yes, Steve. Uh, Steve Gray from Kaiser Permanente. We at Kaiser Permanente are also concerned, and it's part of our concern was reflected in a recent publication of an article, and I can't remember where it was, whether it was AARP or something, but it identified that seniors were at high risk for uh, uh, getting into medical trouble, et cetera, by buying drugs online. Of, of all the groups, they were the ones at highest risk for doing that for a variety of reasons. So I would suggest then that besides reaching out to the chains and health plans and so forth, uh, you, that one particular one might be one that you want to help spread to uh, senior groups uh, around the state and so forth. Okay, good, good idea. Thank you, Steve. Okay, any other comments? If not, let's move on to item K, update on the script newsletter. Now, the summer of 2016 edition of the script was published early September 2016. And board staff was currently working on articles on the winter 2016 and 17 edition of the script. The goal is to have the new study published by January 1st, 2017. So it, it is up to, for you guys to review. Any members comment? Any public comment on this item? If not, we'll update you on item I, which is an update on the media activities. Um, so on MPA Media, July 14, Catherine Feather, regulations of acupuncture and needle distributors, and Capital Television Network News on July 27, 2016, Jonathan Underland, a drug take back regulations. KPIX was. Victor, can we just yeah. kind of reference? I think they're all in writing they're and right. they're on the yeah. handout. Yeah. We can we just reference them if they have any information. Okay, well, yeah, we could. So yeah. if you guys want to review, this is all on the materials that you have. Um, also on item M, which is on the pub update of public outreach activities conducted by the board. So you would see all these outreach activities that the board staff are doing from July 18 all the way to October the 5th. And I'm also informed by board staff that in the future, we will also post you on future activities by board staff. So instead of reporting just the past activities, we're gonna tell you ahead of time, say in November or December, when the, the staff will go or supervisor will go to attend what kind of meetings so you guys will know and go to attend. Uh, that will be something that I, I think it will be a good change for the future. Instead of reporting the past, yeah. let's look to the future. Yeah. Uh, any comments from board members? I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you, Sho. <laughs> Public? If not, then we'll go back to uh, item N. Review and discussion of the California Department of Public Health comparison between the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain and the Medical Board of California guidelines for prescribing controlled substances for pain. The committee discussed the California Department of Public Health's comparison between the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain and the Medical Board of California's guideline for prescribing controlled substances for pain. A copy of the California Department of Public Health comparison is included in attachment nine. So this is FYI only. You will like, take a look at the comparison between the two. Any uh, comments from board members? Well, I have a curiosity. Uh, yes, Dan? It's, um, you know, at one time we were look, working uh, uh, collaboratively with the medical board, you know, uh, trying to develop guideline, guidelines. We have the summit and everything. And, and uh, is any of that still uh, viable? It's my hope that we have a future summit, maybe around some of the cures use and the cures data that is out there um, and better use of cures because I'm doing a presentation Saturday on the new cures program t at CSHP. But I think we need to go beyond that so that the prescribers and the dispensers can better work together. Um, and the, the subject of opioid abuse is still a problem. I think we still need to talk a little bit about it. 
Um, this particular item here, I think we need the medical board to figure out where they're going with respect to recommendations for California policy. And whether or not they do their own thing or whether or not they get closer to the CDC guidelines is really their call. But I think once they're done, I think we have an obligation to share them with our licensees so that prescribers and dispensers are more or less on the same page. And Jenny, didn't you, when you're doing your EO report, didn't you, this is one Yeah, this is what yep. we, I specifically yeah. did call yeah. out. Thank you. Uh, Victor? Yes. Uh, since you're on the education committee, can you coordinate with uh, Jenny, maybe uh, have a little more uh, those educational program on the narcotic uh, drug abuse when she give out talk? Uh, not only certain location, maybe all along California, up the coast, and then uh, have them provide free CE for them. Uh, so, I'd like to see more of those program. Yeah, uh, this this is part of our uh, communication plan that we have on the, the the agenda. What are the things we need to do? Uh, who are the target audience we have? And uh, th that's going to be part of our uh, agenda with the committee. So, and we certainly would do more to to the licensees on that part. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. If not, the next. Committee meeting is December the 14, 2016 in Glendale. No, 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 no. December 1st. December 1st. December 1st, 1st. 1st uh, 2016. the summit that we're having on the 14 about the... The committee meeting. The committee means the first. And the first labeling thing. The full thing. board meeting the summit that we're having, having about that measures. federal stuff. So committee meeting is December the 1st, 2016 for anybody who is interested to attend. I think that concludes my oh, wait a minute, report. Wait a minute. Yes, uh, yes, Alan. Your, your, you your report was fascinating. <laughs> but, we, we, but, we do but, things, okay? But. <laughs> Here it comes. But, but, but no. I I think, <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, since this is, just, I just want to point out one thing. It's whatever you're saying is between us and lunch, okay? Okay, I, I know that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make this very quick. <laughs> okay. um, so this is a communication uh, committee, and the communication is supposed to go both ways. So one of the things I've been thinking about, and public's in there also, uh, I'd like to know, uh, get some sort of overarching uh, report to the board, uh, what the public complaints are, what the public is concerned with. You know, we talk about communicating to the public. I'd like to hear what the public is concerned with. And uh, I ha yeah. we haven't had anything like that. Uh, that That's why we like them to come to the meeting and complain so we can hear. Oh, <laughs> come on. Well, you're, you're asking Alan for Be data. Careful what you ask. I for. want some data. I yeah, I don't want people. I don't want people on pub on all the complaints we're receiving. <laughs> That's a good future data. Well, are you don't you think that? Are you talking about complaints about pharmacists or complaints about the board? Oh, they can't have any complaints about the board. Oh, my God. No, about uh, uh, what I'm concerned about is what, what the, the public is bringing to the, uh, to the board, to the, uh, to the um, uh, department. You know, I, I want to know what communication we have with the public. I assume uh, the problems with the board are being brought to us. Uh, but there's other things that, that come to you and your staff that we have no idea of. And so, uh, well, in the case of an if a complaint comes in, we choose to investigate it. So then you see the outcome of that investigation as it goes to discipline. Um, I don't know what you're asking. Those are complaints where the marketplace hasn't worked to, to satisfy the patient. So I don't know quite what you're asking well, well, me to bring. Well, well you know, and, and it, may, it may be that, there's no, that you guys don't get any communications that, that we're not aware of. But I, I kind of... I kind of doubt that there, there's complete satisfaction with the pharmacy uh, uh, structure out there. So, so maybe, uh, maybe he's asking for, like, how many com public complaints are we getting? What types of complaints are we, they reporting? We typically get that in enforcement statistics. Stats. That's, yeah. that's enforcement, enforcement stats. statistics, you get the kinds of cases that are open. So that would be, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily, it would include all the substantiated complaints. It wouldn't include the complaints that right. are that, dismissed right. because they're unsubstantiated or whatever. But, but I think... If I'm correct, Alan's really talking about, he is actually talking about complaints with board enforcement or complaints about oh, process, the process oh, of the board. Oh, that brings up something else. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe I better continue this after lunch. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Your blood sugar is just low. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So okay. we'll go well, ahead. And that just concludes my uh, report, Madam President. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. And as a newly assigned uh, committee member, thanks for taking that on and for your report.
All right, so we're going to go ahead and adjourn for lunch. So we'll take 30 minutes. So we'll be back here right around 1.50. Are we just going to uh, filter out through the uh, hotel?